Howdy, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Browning. Uh, and I'm Behzad Abgari. We are with Cerebrus, and we make the largest chip ever made. The wafer scale engine is 850,000 cores optimized for sparse linear algebra. There is 80 gigabytes of L1 cache, and the chip communicates using an on-chip fabric with a two, 222 petabits per second fabric. This WSE is housed in a custom chassis we call the CS2. This system provides everything the chip needs, power, cooling, and external I.O. in the form of 1.2 terabits of optical ethernet. The system can draw up to 28 kilowatts, but be slotted into a standard data center rack. As ML models have exceeded the size of even one WSE, we've needed to scale out to the wafer scale cluster. While the core computations in the wafer scale cluster are still performed by the CS2 system, External memory X nodes house data and perform non-critical computations. All of these systems communicate via the Swarm X fabric, and we can scale from 1 to 128 CS2s. As you know, in ML models, tensors holding weights and activations have different properties and scaling characteristics. Similarly, the operations that process tensors of different characteristics have different scalability concerns. And so in order to optimize the computations at the entire cluster level, not on an individual device, but over the entire cluster, we have, a new, we have an execution model we call weight streaming, where those external memory X nodes hold the weights, send them to the fabric, where it performs the activation updates in place using that extremely fast RAM. Then during backprop, the gradients are streamed back out to those memory X nodes where the weights are updated in place. By taking this entire cluster of connected systems as the accelerator, we leverage hardware software co-design to drive the overall executions in the most efficient way. And this allows us to treat the entire cluster as a single torch device, with it handling all of the complexity of scaling out, scaling up. Let's see how PyTorch interfaces with it. So let's begin by looking at the, uh, the essential components of the Cerebrus wafer scale cluster and how we can interface with it using PyTorch. So we've developed a pip installable package called Cerebrus PyTorch or CS Torch, um, which allows us to, um, which, which really mirrors the, uh, the Torch API and it, it sort of acts like a drop in replacement. So uh, the primary purpose of this API is to handle the single device abstraction where the entire cluster is treated as a single device, similar to a Torch device. Under the hood, uh, we use uh, lazy evaluation in order to capture the, the computation graph as the operations are traced. Lazy evaluation is actually provided in vanilla PyTorch through the Lazy Tensor Core project. Um, and even though we're a heavy user of Lazy Tensor Core, or LTC for short, uh, we're not the only users. And in fact, TPU devices um, also use uh, LTC in order to execute. Now, once the model has been uh, traced, the next step is compilation, which is facilitated through the TorchMLR project. TorchMLR is an open source, hardware-centric compiler plugin, which allows us to, um, which brings kind of the MLR ecosystem into the PyTorch ecosystem. Through TorchMLR, uh, we're able to lower a user's model um, down to a proprietary Cerebrus MLAR dialect, uh, and then further do optimizations, uh, cluster level optimizations, in order to uh, map it to Cerebrus kernels that can then run on the wafer. And this, this step is really pivotal in, in, in unlocking the performance of, of the wafer scale cluster. So once compilation is complete, we transfer the waste um, to the wafer scale cluster and start execution. Execution is done asynchronously, where through a custom data executor, we transfer data um, to this, uh, the, the CS2s, and then the training loop is responsible for actually retrieving the model outputs. So by decoupling the execution on the wafer scale cluster and the training loop, we can avoid any hindrance that might be caused by the training loop itself. So with that insight, now let's dive into a code example. So on the right, you'll see a fully working code example for running on the wafer scale cluster that I'll go through in details. So first, we begin by importing the CS Torch package. We then go and define the model. So this model can be defined as if you're targeting a single CPU device. There's no model parallelism. There's no tensor parallelism. There's not even a data parallelism that you need to apply as a model developer. This really puts the power at the hands of the developer 
because they don't have to deal with the distributed settings that uh, you would traditionally need to deal with in order to scale to large models. Then after defining the model, we pass it through cstorch.compile, which, which is analogous to a torch.compile, and it really allows us to, uh, to compile for the CS2. Then we define the, uh, the loss function, the optimizer, and the data loader, and then we wrap the data loader with the data executor. Once the all, now that all these pieces are, are kind of initialized, we go and define the training step. So the training step involves basically doing a forward pass, a backward pass, and the optimizer step. And this is very vanilla PyTorch. There's nothing cerebral specific here, except perhaps the CSTorch trace decorator, which lets us do further optimizations on the, on the, exec, on the computational graph. Once all these pieces are in place, we simply run through the data executor, we get the outputs, and that's it. Um, under the hood, what happens on the first step is we trace the model, we do the compile, and we start execution. And in subsequent steps, we're just simply fetching the outputs as the cluster is splitting, the, uh, splitting them out. So you, at this point, you might be wondering, well, how can I actually make my models go faster, right? Because we're all about performance. So that's really easy to do. All you have to do is change a single line of code and to say, I want to scale out to multiple CS2s. And that's it. There's no model changes. There's no changes to the training loop. There's no changes to the, even the batch size. This is all handled within the Wayfair scale cluster. So this really, again, it, I really want to emphasize that this um, allows the ML developer to really focus on what's important to them, um, to not worry about distributed training, to really focus on the model. And uh, be sure that once they scale out to multiple CS2s, they can achieve near linear scaling. On top of scaling out to multiple CS2s, we can also leverage a, hard, a sparsity that's innate in the hardware in order to speed up training. Sparsity in ML models is an active and increasing area of research. But in this context, I mean unstructured weight sparsity. You can view convolution and other algorithms as a form of structured sparsity where the receptive field of a layer is manually constrained. But when the model is able to learn the most efficient connectivity, either through an algorithm or through some sort of stochastic update, you can truly unlock the potential that a sparse model is able to yield at inference time especially, if you have the hardware to support it. Cerebrus has seen this potential from the beginning, and sparsity is baked in at every layer from the WSC all the way up to the wafer scale cluster. We've demonstrated the ability to train to the same accuracy faster using sparsity on the left plot, SFDP, and train to higher accuracy in the same compute budget by increasing the model size and compensating using sparsity, sparse IFT on the right. All of this is enabled using a, a simple but extensible PyTorch API. We framed this problem as optimizing the parameter's sparsity pattern, just like a weight update, a weight uh, optimizer like SGD. A dynamic sparsity optimizer updates the sparsity pattern on a certain cadence according to an algorithm. And we provide a few standard algorithms with CS Torch or static sparsity, which is just a no-op update as a special case to maintain a consistent API. Torch offers some pruning utilities, Torch and Prune, that behave very similarly, but our sparsity optimizers are geared for our ahead-of-time compile requirements and the fully traceability of the model. But in all cases, including Torch and Prune, the representation at the Torch level is masks. In our case, behind the hood, we transform it into the native CSR format. So, even though tr treating the entire cluster as the accelerator is convenient, um, there's a few challenges that we've encountered, a lot of which have been referenced earlier with the export. Um, so if you try to load the entire model into memory, oftentimes it exceeds the host's memory capacity, especially for 175 billion parameters. So we have some automatic um, disk backing whenever you're under memory pressure. Initializing that model can be expensive if you have to run through all of that, and that's redundant when you're about to load from a checkpoint. So we have traced initialization, and we can do that concurrently with the compile to minimize um, overhead. While you're executing, in fact, if you're tracing every step, that can bottleneck the execution of the cluster. And in, feed, in fact, um, even just tracing the ops can be slower than executing. So we have an, an optimization you can opt into, and that's the CS Torch trace, which allows you to reuse the trace from the first step. Honestly, we sh are going to be investigating Torch export, which is a much more um, mentally, it's the right way of uh, thinking this problem. 
Saving and loading checkpoints using torch save and load um, requires all tensors to be available, available, although there's a new distributed torch save, which we'll investigate as well. But CS torch load and save uses an HDF5 format for single tensor access without having to load them all. So in conclusion, we have built and made available an extreme computing platform, but we've made it accessible through an extremely easy to use PyTorch API, which allows you to scale up to large model sizes or run faster using sparsity. We're available for any questions after this talk. Thank you. <laughs>